So one day, you're scrolling through menus in a game and see something that piques your interest. A firearm, mission, cosmetic item. And after inspection, you're met with this. Or this, or this. Now, these roadblocks aren't as recent as some may think. Back in the day, it was PC expansion packs making many servers inaccessible to those who didn't or couldn't pay up. In the 7th generation, it was map packs, pre-order bonuses, and cheap DLC. And today, it is ubiquitous. From MMOs to racers, shooters, fighters, and many, many more, there is no shortage of segments in games, cut off from the main experience, and this almost always generates a conversation. Many complaining that this makes the game less valuable, and just as many saying that you're not entitled to extra content, with a group in the middle asking, who cares? Why do cosmetics matter? They don't affect gameplay. It's just one mode, not vital to the experience. The DLC is cheap. Who doesn't have $3? And these comments aren't entirely incorrect. Cosmetics generally don't affect who wins a round of Siege. Most people didn't buy Modern Warfare for Horde mode, and $3 is the price of two candy bars. However, I do believe these comments often undervalue what cosmetics, modes, and extra content deliver for players. And there's no better recent example than Need for Speed Heat. This wasn't supposed to happen. Need for Speed hasn't earned a shred of gratitude in 10 years, Ghost Games' previous titles sparked unrivaled outrage, and EA has all the likability of this man's name. I doubted this game from its inception, and I think justifiably based on previous experience, the limited marketing material, and publisher behind it. Yet it absolutely dominated my weekdays and weekends in December, clocking in more playtime than the original Most Wanted. And it certainly wasn't for the awful story, limited open world, or relatively slow introduction. What kept me seemingly hooked on this game in a manner Need for Speed hasn't done in years isn't merely that the core gameplay is enjoyable. It's that the game completely lacks all the roadblocks we expect in big budget titles. For instance, when you earn enough money to finally customize a vehicle, this is when you'd expect the system to be loaded with grindy challenges in an effort to keep you engaged with the world, lock parts behind random drops to make you play more, or straight up lock things behind a paywall. Because multiple game franchises, including Need for Speed, has done this. But no, you just buy whatever you want with in-game credits. Sculpt vehicles into whatever your imagination conceives. And there's a variety of not just cosmetics, but also tuning options to create unique vehicles mechanically, not just visually. Everything from a dragster to rally and racing cars, drift machines, and so on. All of this is combined with arguably the best livery editor available, with thousands of skins being uploaded by the community that not only rival that of professional packs, but can also be applied to any other vehicle in the game. There's not just hours of enjoyment spent tinkering with everything that's adjustable, it helps to facilitate Heat's core gameplay. It's not someone's Lamborghini or wheel spin drop on the grid. Your car is. A car you built, either steadily since the game's opening hours, or completely off a whim after winning races all over the game's Miami-inspired streets. Used to challenge or dominate entirely new sets of races, time trials, and drift events requiring different demands from your creations. And this only expands when taking online play into consideration. Friends and I intentionally challenged ourselves with vehicles, running Testarossas, Countaches, and Diablos to Synthwave at night, quarter-mile beasts, and drifting from the cops. And absolutely none of this would have been possible had he utilized these common roadblocks in an effort to make gamers play more or pay more. Races would carry no personal weight had the vehicles be stock selections. The game's open world couldn't handle excessive grinding without meaningful rewards. And buying vehicles with real money saps not merely the enjoyment of earning them, but also appreciating the contrast between how you started and ended. Going 200 miles an hour in this game feels terrifying here come the come <laughs> And doubly so when starting out machines incapable of reaching anything close to that. While ensuring the player isn't stuck there for so long that by the time they've bought a supercar, their impact is muted. But Ghost Games didn't do that, despite the fact they very well could have. Because the truth is, while Heat is extremely enjoyable, there's actually very little in this game that the developer hasn't already done. The daytime-nighttime mechanic that has players earning money in day and risking their reputation at night, it's just an expansion of what their first game, Need for Speed Rivals, did. You'd also lose all your earnings in that game after getting busted, failing to bank everything at the safe house. 
The brilliant customization system was established in only their second game, the Need for Speed reboot in 2015. Though not only some cars lacked any customization at all, even the wheels, you couldn't adjust various components until sinking multiple hours into the game. And you could only have four cars at a time. The extremely fun off-road racing and vastly improved handling model that remedies my issues with the numb steering in this series, that was all done in Payback, where the game held everyone's progress with mobile gaming tactics. There's very little that's new in Need for Speed Heat. The difference is that Ghost and EA let us off the leash. Rather than fragmenting the experience through a variety of gatekeeping techniques, you just play the game enjoying everything that it has to offer with nothing beyond the asking price. Uh, Ray, there's a problem. What do you mean? Look. Oh, for God's sake. Now, to be clear, should every game follow in Need for Speed's wake? Yes. Can they? Realistically, no. The statistics have long been established. There is tons of money to be made from cosmetic items, gameplay tweaks, and DLC. Those aren't going away, and frankly, it's not ill-suited to every game. Free-to-plays obviously don't have an entrance fee, so it makes sense to charge for those who are more invested in personalizing their experience. Multiple shooters are centered more around gameplay than cosmetics, and DLC can be valuable. Personally, I enjoyed Need for Speed Heat enough to welcome additional modes and vehicles. But that goes both ways. The decision to charge for various items, cosmetics, and content is just that. It's a choice. And not all choices are created equal. In Rainbow Six Siege, there are cosmetics for most of its operators, and some have enough to make them feel unique to the player using them. This is my dock, my calf, etc. Tweaking characters to look exactly like you want is in keeping with prior entries and an enjoyable part of the game for some of its most active users. But they are the minority as the in-game expense of these items requires many hours to earn or real cash to purchase. An enjoyable component of the game doesn't offer its full potential to the average player. This being the case is inarguable, but it's not indefensible. It's withholding a portion of the game not nearly as critical to its enjoyment for the user base to turn enough profits that ensures there continues to be a player base. The game can afford to sacrifice this component for the average player, but now imagine Need for Speed Heat with an identical system where parts, colors, and decals are primarily earned in RNG, and specialized body kits require $15. Removing cosmetics to average players in this game would cripple it. None of the positive experiences I listed earlier would have happened. It'd be the equivalent of Resident Evil charging you per campaign or Monster Hunter locking weapon types behind specific characters. One of the most compelling aspects of this game would have been lost, and it's hardly the only case. Everyone needs to make a buck, but what's being sacrificed isn't negligible. It does affect the overall experience, and sometimes to the point of destruction. It's pleasing to see more games making calculated decisions about what to give common players and reserve for enthusiasts. But one can hope for a world of realistic compromise to have more of the ideal. What is the PS5 gonna look like? If there's one place you could go cost-free and all-inclusive, where would you go and why? Iceland. No, not for the reason you think. Just ever since watching it on Top Gear years ago, I've always just been slightly entranced by its backdrops, a little pocket of the earth unlike anything else. I don't know if they've already done this, but if they haven't, there should absolutely be a Tomb Raider game taking place there. When is H years later? After I finish A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Favorite shooter pre-2010. Which game soundtrack fills you up with the most nostalgia?